Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What is your destiny? What is our destiny as a church? What does destiny really mean anyway? Well, destiny is the idea that everything in your life is beyond your control. You have no options, no choices. The extreme form of belief in destiny is called fatalism. Fate is what rules your life. I think of it as the Eeyore outlook on life. Well, there's nothing I can do about it. I have no control. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, what about predestination? Presbyterians have understood predestination in various ways throughout history. But predestination points us to God's act of salvation, giving credit where credit is due. And so we are humbled by God's grace. The kind of talk of destiny that I am wary of is one that eliminates human accountability for the choices we make in life. With that line of thinking, we would get to blame everything that we do on something else. Sort of like Flip Wilson with, the devil made me do it. But in reality, God has and continues to give us choices. Even Jesus had a choice. Think of his struggle and prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yet not my will be done, but yours. Jesus was obedient even unto the cross. In our scripture today, when Jesus appears to the disciples, several things are going on. First, Jesus must overcome their disbelief. There is a mix of fear, doubt, and joy. And prior to this reading, they had just heard the story about the two people who saw Jesus on the road to Emmaus. You know, it's like when you're telling a story about someone and you expect them to be far away. And all of a sudden, Jesus appears. No wonder they were afraid and uncertain about who or what is speaking to them. So Jesus proves to them who he is. Look at my hands and my feet. I am Jesus, the one who was crucified. Now Jesus needs to convince the disciples that he's not a ghost. And in Greek thought, the soul is the only thing that lives on forever. Only the soul is immortal. The body is something to be cast off so that the soul can be free. The soul is imprisoned in the body. Sort of like the cartoon character who expires and then whose soul sprouts wings and flies away, leaving the body behind. The separation of body and soul was so ingrained in Greek thought that the church at Corinth struggled with the idea of a bodily resurrection. They asked, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? And Paul uses the analogy of a seed that is buried. The seed goes into the ground with a particular body, and what comes up is wheat or another grain. But it is a body that God has given it, God the creator. Each kind of seed has its own body. And then he goes on to say that there is an earthly body and a heavenly body. The earthly body is perishable, but the heavenly body lives forever, imperishable. Touch me and find out for yourselves, Jesus said. This is flesh and blood. Do you have anything to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it to prove that yes, this is a body. The disciples witnessed the fact that Jesus was crucified 
and was raised from the dead. But their witness wasn't only about how Jesus healed, taught, and fed people. They were witnesses to the power of God, that death does not have the final word, that God does. That is the core of Christian belief. That is our good news. Jesus then continues to explain the scriptures to the disciples, and wouldn't you love to have been there for that? He reminded the disciples that all that had been talked about was to happen, and he showed them the scriptures. Now, we don't know exactly what Jesus told them, but the main point is to think that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. This was not typically what people expected from the Messiah. But the suffering and the rising from the dead was all a part of God's plan from the beginning. Jesus obeyed God and God's plan. And then he sends the disciples to Jerusalem to wait for power from on high. Through the ages, Christ has been proclaimed. Today, we are the witnesses, the ones to proclaim the significance of what the disciples saw, to proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name to all nations. And even though we cannot touch the Lord's physical hands and feet, we can still bring the presence of Christ as we engage the world in Jesus' name, by healing, confronting injustice, showing God's love to people at the fringe of society. We can start simply by greeting someone during the fellowship time. So I would not call what we do with our lives following destiny beyond our control. Instead, I would say that the way we live is based on a choice whether or not to be a witness to a holy, loving, life-giving God, the one who forgives and redeems us from death, the one who saves sends and blesses. Now, there are different ways to witness, and I know sometimes even the word witness can have people go <gasps> and draw in a deep breath. There is a kind of witness that is in response to people who have seen your life, and they question you, and they ask, why, why is your life different? Peter instructs the believers to always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is within you, yet do it with gentleness and reverence. We do need to be able to explain what God has done in Christ, but we need both life and words together so that there is integrity in our story. Kathleen Norris, author and poet, in preaching, to a con in, to, in preaching to her congregation, congratulated them for the way they welcomed her when she first began attending that church. They had respected the mystery of faith, she writes. It's like a marriage in that only the two parties involved really know what's going on and had pretty much left me alone to work out my relationship with God and with them. I came back to church in fits and starts, and if I was missing in action for a while, they did not send an outreach committee to my door. Maybe some of them wondered what was going on, while others knew I was engaged in studying with the pastors. But no one pressured me, and I am most grateful. The people in the congregation did evangelize in another sense by saying and doing things they probably don't remember. Most likely, they didn't think of it as evangelizing. The name of Jesus, for example, may not have come up, but little things they said or did revealed their faith in healthy and appealing ways. Something about the way they lived their faith, or even failed to live it, failings I could recognize in myself, convinced me to throw my lot in with them and join the church. I could recognize evangelism not as a matter of talking about the faith, but of living it. Evangelism means living in such a way that others may be attracted to you and your values, but not taking it as a license to preach to them. You may be aching to tell all about 
the joy that you found in knowing Jesus, but it might not be the right time for it. The best evangelism, the show don't tell kind, presumes an understanding of relationship that precludes forcing your faith on another person. I am thankful for Kathleen Norris's story. Witness is not a word to be afraid of, nor do we want to force our faith on someone else. There is a balance. We do need to be able to explain what we believe. The question for a follower of Jesus, then, is not what is your destiny, but what is your witness? Our witness is not a formula. We are not Jesus bots. We are God's creation. We make mistakes, which means we can learn a lot. We forgive and ask for forgiveness. So how do we know that we are where God wants us to be? Well, there is a level of being in tune with God. And then sometimes it's a matter of just staying where you are until things change, until there's an urging. And so every day we worship, we pray, we work, we play, and follow Jesus step by step, little by little. And God gives us choices in those days. Now, sometimes we can get really freaked out by choices. I can remember in high school thinking, oh, should I wear this dress or that one? Because I wanted my life to be so aligned with Christ that I questioned almost everything I did. It reminds me of the commercial comparing two brands of spaghetti sauce. After selecting the right brand, the consumer wonders, what other bad choices have I made? Looking back, I wish that I had the opportunity to ask a more mature Christian, is this normal or weird or what? Of course, I could have talked to my mom, but you know, it would have been really nice to have another voice. And this is something for us all to think about. How can we be that other voice for our young people and for each other. And then there are the moral choices. Do I lie? Oh, I really want such and such. How can I get it? I wonder if I could steal it without anybody noticing. Well, we face the consequences of those actions. We also make decisions on how to raise a family. What are our priorities? How much money do we give to the church? How involved will we be? Those are choices closely related to what I would call directional choices. Now, this is the time of year when high school seniors are coming closer to finalizing college choices or deciding the kind of job they want. College graduates contemplate, should I relocate or live at home for a while? Others may consider, should we sell the house and move into a retirement community? Should we even think about retirement? All of these choices require prayer. But the answer is in our day-to-day -day choices, how we interact with people, and how, with God's help, we give shape to our witness. We are known by our choices. Our choices reflect what we believe. We also have choices as a church. How will we be known? What is our witness to the crucified and risen Christ? The Book of Order, part of our Presbyterian Constitution, gives us guidance with the great ends of the church. They are the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind, the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God, the maintenance of divine worship, the preservation of the truth, the promotion of social righteousness, and the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. The details of our particular church are determined by a combination of our location and the gifts and talents in the church and how we hear and respond to God. Destiny only relates to an uncontrollable future, 
blown around by the whims of fate. There is no future in that kind of destiny, but there is a future in being a community of witness to God. Everyone has a part, little by little, step by step, each day, walking with the risen Lord. Do this and watch how God will work among us.